yesterday, it turned out just a hair that little echoey. Maybe I've got a big mouth today. My wife would agree with that. Um, so yesterday, believe it or not, my family and I were in Brandon, Florida, which is five hours south of here. And, uh, and one of the things we did on our way back up was we stopped through Lake Wales. Lake Wales is where Amy and I spent a lot of our, um, I'll say, younger life. Uh, we went to undergraduate school in Lake Wales. Amy did her graduate work there. I took on several of my pastorates in the surrounding cities. But the one that I keep going back to, the one that's like extra special for me, is in Lake Wales is where I was first a youth pastor. Okay? And if you've ever heard me share, then I started remembering that, honestly, I've been able to keep up with a lot of the kids over the years. And, and unfortunately, some of them, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. They made some rough choices. But I remember just a few weeks, or a few months back, I tried to keep up with them on Facebook. One of them that I hadn't talked to in years reached out to me, okay? And this young lady... Just, and, and i got to give God the glory for this, honestly. This young lady just says, I, I want you to know that I credit you and all the leaders of, of the youth group with really helping me understand who God is and it changed my life. And I'm a happily married woman now. And I'm trying to bring my kids up in the way of God. And we lead a, a couple's Bible study from our house through our church. And this young lady, I testified against her father and his trial. Y'all, wherever you come from, whatever's been done to you or whatever goes on in your life doesn't determine who you are. Our God can change your life. He can change every bit of you. He can transform who you are. And that's the God we're here to worship today. We have some announcements for us. Uh, first of all, today is our Moses Basket Sunday. We're also going to be taking some time to dedicate these prayer shawls. Uh... Our prayer show ministry is something that's been going on for a little while now. Um, we invite everybody, anybody, feel free to take one, take two, take ten. Uh, give it to people who have physical needs, spiritual needs, emotional needs, who just need to know God loves them. We have a new display in the back. I encourage you to check that out after service. And there's a little card attached to it that basically says, uh, these have been prayed over for you. And so when we give our, uh, when we ask God's dedication over the Moses baskets, we're also going to ask his dedication over all these new prayer shells because we've already given away close to 200 of them. And we want to keep that ministry going strong. I also want to let you know that this evening at 6 p.m., we're going to be hosting our uh, yearly charge conference. This is something that Methodists have done for generations, goes all the way back to John Wesley. Uh, it's a time when we sit down, usually with a couple of other Methodist churches, we are accountable to them, they to us, for are you putting good leaders in place? How are your finances being held? Are you uh, caring for the members of your church? Are you just making sure that the membership roles aren't just filling up for absolutely no reason? And um, how are you caring for your pastor and a couple other things? This year, our district superintendent has chosen to do something a little bit different, and I think this is a great idea for this year. Uh, he's doing several of them, a bunch of them actually, independently. And so our district superintendent, Wayne Wyatt, will be here 6 p.m. tonight. We'll be in the fellowship hall for our charge conference. Everyone is welcome to attend. The leaders of our church and those on church council are the voting members. Okay? And then lastly, I want to share with you all uh, something that I told my daughter last night. I said, given what my last, our last name is, if mommy gets mad at me, does that make her up?
We're going to head over to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 to 26. Luke 16, verses 19 to 26. I find that our lectionary brings us here kind of ironically today, given what we are going to be talking about. Uh, this is a, a parable that Jesus tells about a rich man who acts entitled and a poor beggar that lays at his, um, lays outside. Uh, and, and when they die, the rich man is in Hades and, and the poor man is with Abraham um, in eternity with God. And the rich man says to Abraham, have him come over and give me some water. The rich man, even in death, thinks so little of the poor man, he doesn't even address him. He addresses Here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. The word of God for you, the people of God. Y'all, let's continue worshiping our God together as we give back to him a little of what he's given to us through our tithes, our offerings, and our prayer requests.
things we're going to talk about today is John's mommy. Okay? John's mommy's name was Suzanne. Suzanne had 19 children. Yeah, could you imagine having 18 brothers and sisters? Yeah. Ah! It would be crazy. It would be crazy. Okay, hold on. And could you imagine the fact that Miss Suzanne homeschooled them all? She was their teacher. She taught them everything, how to read, how to write. She even taught them different languages. She taught some of them Latin and Greek. Yep, I'm sorry. That's easy? Oh, good. I'm glad Latin's easy for you. It's not for me. I can only spag it. I'm going to start calling my group the Methodists. So his mommy, who was just trying to take care of a good family, actually accidentally helped to make our name. Wait, this name? Huh? The, the name Methodist. Okay? And so I say that to say this. Anytime we try to do what's right in God's eyes, not only is it going to impact our life, but you have no idea the good you're going to do in other people's lives. Okay? Let's go ahead and pray. I invite you guys to pray after me. Dear God, Dear God help, me to do good help me to do good things. 
the way you want. The way you want. And in doing good, help me to help others too. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. All right. You want the box for this week? Okay. Are we going to be back next week, Grandma? Awesome. Then please take it. Here's your baseball hat. Thanks for sharing that. And y'all go on ahead. We'll talk about that later. Come on. I, I'm good. I didn't think so. Anybody ever had somebody, even if it wasn't just overbearing, somebody in their life that, that tended to be a little extra critical? And if you ask them why they're constantly pointing out your faults or somebody else's faults or just any fault, they, they say, I'm just trying to help. But the problem is that when all you ever do is point out the faults, it's not helpful anymore. And anybody in your life... You ever saw anybody that struggled with controlling their family or put unrealistic He's encouraging him, look, just because they're criticizing you, just because they're trying to make you think that if we don't have money, money's the most important thing, or, or we need to give into the false teachings, which is really easy to fall into those things when enough people are yelling, right? Doesn't make it the right thing. You stand up for what's good, regardless of what's around you. You don't have to become a product of your environment. And this is a word of encouragement that Paul gives him. And I wonder how many of us might be able to relate to it as well. Listen to this in 1 Timothy 6, 11 to 16. But you, man of God, if I may be bold enough to say also, but you, women of faith, flee from all this and pursue righteousness. That is what's right in God's eyes. Pursue godliness, faith, Love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many. Witnesses. 
in the sight of God, who gives life to everything, just a short time. Because if you were here last week, you, you heard us talking about uh, this guy named John Wesley that we've already mentioned. This guy that God used to start the Methodist movement. Well, what I want to do today is I, I found so often the rare times when a preacher does mention this guy, they often don't explain much of who he is. And so that's why it's so important to me. If I'm going to ask you to worship as part of this family, I want you to know where we come from. But at the same time, what goes beyond that is the rest of his family. And, and we rarely ever even talk about that in the church. And the reason that that's important is because where John comes from really formed a lot of who he was and how it is we came to be where we're at today. Okay? You already heard me share just a little bit of Susanna Wesley's story, John's mom, with the kids. But there's a lot more to this. You, you heard me share last week that, that Suzanne had 19 children. Poor mom, right? But out of that, only 10 survived to adulthood. Um, the other part of the family that we often will hear sometimes about is this guy named Charles. On your screen there, what you see is you see John Wesley, the guy in color. The guy that's in black and white, that is his brother, Charles Wesley. Uh, Charles was not only a, a, a pastor in the Church of England as well as John, but Charles is actually most well known because he wrote over 9,000 Christian poems, many of which became the hymns that you love today. This guy, Charles, wrote such songs as, Oh, for a thousand tongues to see, my great Redeemer's praise. Hark the herald angels sing. <coughs> Christ the Lord is risen today. He wrote, O can it be? Alas, and did my Savior bleed? Come, thou fount of every blessing. And by the way, at that point, I was only up to the seas in the 9,000 poems he wrote. I was just looking for the ones that are the most familiar. And I gave up after the seas. Okay? <laughs> There's that many of them. Um... John and Charles went to Oxford University together to, to get their, uh, uh, for, for seminary. And um, one thing that a lot of people don't know about them is that on breaks, like Christmas or spring break, was her, her first son's name? Samuel. This poor lady had a lot of Samuels in her life to keep straight. Alright? So, so I'm going to just refer to her father as Dr. Ainsley. Dr. Samuel Ainsley. Dr. Ainsley was this guy who was very strong-willed. Very tenacious. Um, he, he was very independent. Very, very smart. And um, and he himself was a pastor in the Church of England. Now, about the late 1600s, early 1700s, uh, was when the Church of England, which had formed out of the Catholic Church, they broke off because one of the kings of England wanted to get a divorce, and the Catholic Church wouldn't let him. That's where the Church of England kind of comes from. That was at least one of the kicking off points for it. Um, there was a point when uh, Pastor Ainsley was preaching and a parliament passed a law that said not only is everyone required by law to be a Christian, but you must and can only practice Christianity in the ways of the Church of England. Okay? Dr. Ainsley, for theological and political and other reasons, said, I just can't do that. I can't live that kind of life. And so he and about 2,000 other pastors became what was known as the Dissension Church, or the church that descended away from the Church of England. Because of this, Dr. Ainsley often faced being arrested, imprisoned, and even in to get drunk and act inappropriately. 
from the pulpit. When Pastor Ainsley came in, he put the kibosh on that right away. He said, no, this is not right. This is not what the Word of God says. And he often received death threats. But he just kept doing what was right. By the time he died, even though it was still illegal for him and some of the laws were relaxed, uh, he was preaching up to 10 to 15 times a week. And this attitude of tenacity, this attitude of independence, this, this brilliance is something he passed on to his, I kid you not, 25th child, Susanna Wesley. Okay? Susanna, you kind of get the idea of her tenacity a bit too because at the age of 12 years old, 12, 13, somewhere in there, she decides that there's this big argument going on between the dissenting church and the Church of England. So 12-year-old girl, late 1600s, sits down and she decides to read what all the scholars are thinking makes a list of what she thinks is the most important, and at 12 years old, 13, decides she's going to leave her daddy's church and go to the Church of England. And she did. She also decided that, uh, early on in her life that, um, that she would never spend more time in rest and hobby than in the Word of God. If she spent an hour in the Word, uh, playing or doing something, that she would spend at least an hour and a half or an hour and 15 minutes in the Word of God that day. That was a covenant she made with God, and she kept that all of her life. At 19 years old, she, she got married to another guy named Samuel, right? Uh, this was John Wesley, Charles Wesley's father. Um, Samuel, his dad was also a pastor in the Church of England that had left and went to the Dissension Church. And Samuel was also a man who had left when he got older and went back to the Church of England. Samuel was a pastor in the Church of England. Samuel Wesley was not a man of tall stature, okay? Um, but unfortunately, Samuel Wesley did not seem to get into preaching for the right reasons. From his writings and from other accounts of him, um, and even as a pastor, well serving in a pulpit somewhere, uh, in the 1700s when you were in debt up to a certain amount, uh, you could um, petition the courts to have that person arrested and thrown into what was called debtor's prison. And Samuel Wesley was thrown into prison on multiple occasions while he was a pastor because of his debt. This made it extremely difficult for Suzanne. Suzanne, if you ever see like a documentary of the house they lived in, that he mainly served in a church at, in a city called Eppenworth or Epworth. And, and, and there was like this back kitchen area that was just to be for the servants, but Suzanne changed it. And she made it to be a classroom for her student, or for her children. She homeschooled every one of her kids. And she changed it like that because there was this big fireplace back there so the kids could keep warm during wintertime. Her daddy taught her to read and write, which was a huge deal for a young lady in that time. And she wanted to do the same thing with her daughters. Susanna Wesley not only taught her daughters to read and write, but she taught them Latin and Greek. She was actually known to be highly schooled and fluent in the most latest forms of philosophy and what was known as ideology back then. She was a very brilliant, very educated woman, but she was very stubborn and strong-willed as well. Um, it, it was well known that, that Susanna, as she created that rigid schedule I told the kids of all over earlier, that, that, that she only used a single textbook to ever teach her kids how to read and write, teach them about history, teach them about social studies, teach them about science, everything. There was only one book she ever used. It was the Bible. As a matter of fact, years later when John Wesley um, was really being moved by the Holy Spirit and, and he ended up preaching outside a lot. We'll talk about this more next week. Um, he did some radical stuff that was taboo at the time. He would go to places where the worst of the worst workers were, the deepest 
um, um, laborers were. And he would teach them while they work in the fields. Uh, one of the biggest problems in the time was, was coal miners. Coal miners would work from 12 to 14 hours. spent so much of her adult life pregnant and alone and honestly in a lot of poverty. This woman just kept fighting forward to keep doing what was right to care for her kids. That this rigid schedule was her way to love on them and care for them. But once a week, Suzanne set aside one hour for every child. Every child. Like Tuesday at 3 o'clock was so-and-so's time. And she would check on them, see how they're doing, what's going on in their lives, how their studies are going. But she was also extremely concerned with their spiritual life. And she'd ask about their prayer life and how things are going with them. It's really interesting because, as you can imagine, with somebody who really struggled with controlling his family... And feeling like I'm the man of the house, I'm in charge, and someone as strong-willed as Suzanne, okay? The, 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 there was often some tiffs in the family. And because Charles was, or Samuel was a pastor with the Church of England, his escape was he would go up to England and spend a couple of days there just to get out and recharge. The problem was that these little escapes for him to the big church were very costly, which just drove them into further debt. While he was gone, he would often have a guy from the church preach, the same guy over and over. This guy would often stand up, and, and, and instead of preaching the truth and love of Jesus Christ, his sermons over and over again were about the sin of debt. He was publicly trying to call out his pastor and shame him in front of the congregation. People stopped coming to the church. And Suzanne noticed that these people were truly hungry for the truth of Jesus Christ and the grace of God to know who he was really all about. So she started doing Bible studies in her own house. She would pull out an old book that had a, a, an old sermon written down in it. She would read it and invite people to her kitchen. At first there was five or seven people. In a couple of months, or a year, I think it was, they grew to over 200 people. There were more people in Suzanne's kitchen than there were in church on Sunday. Samuel kept coming back from his little retreats, and somehow the church had grown, and he couldn't figure it out. At one point, somebody from the church wrote Samuel on one of his little excursions and said, do you know what your wife is doing? So he writes her back and says, I am the man of the house. I am the pastor. You need to cease and desist all this stuff right now. To which she dutifully replied, I am an obedient wife and a woman of faith, and if you give me a direct command to stop, I will. But, if, I'm going to try to get this as close as possible. But if I do, then the great judging and um, uh, the great judging and holy God will put it upon your hearts to have uh, the spiritual charge of all of these individuals. All of a sudden, Samuel was once again okay with her having that Bible study in the house. Okay? Look, every one of John and, Su uh, John and Charles' sisters, every one of them struggled with a bad marriage, except for one. You ever hear the phrase, the apple don't fall far from the tree? Every one of them had husbands who were controlling, or drunks, only one of them had a good marriage. She was crippled as a child, and everybody thought, who could ever love her? And yet a good, hard-working man married her. And she was the only one that had a happy marriage out of all the ladies in that family. Look, I don't know where you come from. I, I don't know what you've struggled with. When I say the phrase, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, I don't know what that means to you. When you hear the phrase that we've all heard, you're a product of your environment, I don't know how deeply or shallowly that gets into you. But what I do know is this, that according to Hebrews 4.12, I love this scripture, it has meant so much to me in my life, the, the, word, the, the Bible says, the word of God is alive and active. 
sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even between soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You've heard me say time and time again, the heart of the matter is a matter of your heart. Right? When I work with people who struggle with addiction, I, I tell them several things, and one of the things I tell them, first of all, is just because your family was like that doesn't mean you have to be like that. The scriptures tell us that, that God literally makes us born again for a reason, that we are made new, washed clean. Just because your daddy struggled with anger doesn't mean you have to be abusive to your spouse. Just because so many in your family struggle with alcohol doesn't mean you are condemned to do that your whole life. You are not owned by things that are out of your control. That doesn't mean you won't wrestle with them, though. Look, the number one thing I think that, that we all miss when we talk about addiction, and addiction can be so much more than substances. Addiction can be manipulation. It can be control. It can be overbearingness. I think what, what people struggle with is, is when that thing rocks up inside of them, that temptation to sin, that thing where we go, oh man, I, dad was like that, and I never wanted to be like that, but here I go again. I think what happens is we beat the daylights out of ourselves, and we go, God, where are you? And we hear about moments when God completely takes it away from people. Yes, he does, but it's crazy rare. That God can carve out bone from marrow, soul from spirit. Just because dad acted that way doesn't mean you are going to act that way. But at the same time, this is why we come back here every week. This is why we get into the word of God. This is why we seek to live what's called a righteous life. Because we aren't just followers of God. We are disciples of Jesus Christ, students of his. The word righteousness, another way to say that is the honor of God. You are called to hold up the honor of God. You are people of honor, high and holy honor. And what this world calls honor is a completely different thing. We are to live by the standards of God. Honor is doing what's right even if it's hard, even if it's not popular, and even if it's downright painful. You are called to be people of honor. And you are the holy people of God. You don't give up. If God can use somebody that is extremely blunt, as John Wesley was, um, independent, I'm trying to find nice words, bullheaded, and he got it all, you can see from where. And yet God can use someone like that to literally transform the face of Christianity across the world. Then your past and your lineage does not define you. Let me give you our scripture one more time in a synopsis. Here's what Paul says to Timothy. Flee from all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. You've given a public proclamation of your faith. Christ gave a public proclamation of his faith in front of Pontius Pilate, though it wasn't easy. Paul says, I love this, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blemish until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, the reality is that we all have things that we wrestle with. We all have stuff of our past, stuff that has been put on us, and that this world has tried to put into us. And Lord, we will always have our struggles. It ain't going to go away. We live in a broken, sinful, flawed world. And you're not our genie in a bottle, just there to grant our wishes and make all of our problems go away. So it is in knowing that. That we will accept who we are and yet fight the good fight of faith. We will recognize that we are not perfect and we're probably going to have to expect those negative or inappropriate thoughts to come back again and again. And Lord, when it happens, not if, when we slip up, Lord, we will get back up. 
we will dust off. We will recognize that it's part of who we are, but it doesn't control us and make us our identity. We will fight the good fight of faith. And Lord, I pray that strength over my brothers and sisters here. As we thank you for the fact that we are not in this holy divine fight alone, but that you make us righteous. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Friends, join us in our hymn of dedication, Trust and Obey, number 467. Please getting a cell phone repaired and I ended up speaking with the guy who was a young man who was working there and he found out I was a pastor and of course so everything goes to religion at that moment and it turns out that he was Hindu and he says I, I, I hope you don't take this as an offense but I'm not so weak that I need to have a God like yours who is all about the forgiveness and the and, and you know you, you don't have to be perfect and all that such and I remember sitting there thinking Dude, if you take my faith seriously, it is hard stuff. It is not easy. But let me tell you something. Our faith is not just another philosophy of life. Christ truly changes us. He makes us brand new. Where you come from does not define who you are. God can change anything in your life. He can carve out the most destructive, inappropriate and hateful parts and make you new that doesn't mean you won't have struggles you have been changed and Christ continues to work change in you so don't give up the faith keep fighting to be a disciple receive that as your mission and your blessing in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen <laughs>